Good morning, everyone. Hope you are all well. Welcome to the 2022 National Ryan White Conference on HIV Care and Treatment Session, HIV Aging Institute 201, Integrating Geriatric Services into the Ryan White HIV AIDS Program Clinics. Presentation from nurse consultant Tracy Gant and Dr. Jacob Walker. My name is Natalie Solomon Bramage. I'm a public health project officer and um, excuse me, in the HIV and AIDS Bureau within the Clinical and Quality Branch. I will be serving as your moderator today. We thank you for joining today's session. As you participate in this session, please feel free to add your questions or comments to the chat box. And also for better viewing quality in the upper right-hand corner of your screen, there's a tab or a, a little toggle that says either gallery view or speaker view. Please uh, click speaker view so that you can see all the slides and everything clearly. At the conclusion of the session, the presenters will have the opportunity to address your questions. So let's begin. Good morning, all. Welcome to HRSA's Aging Institute Session 201, Integration of Geriatric Services into Ryan White HIV AIDS Programs. My name is Tracy Gant. I am a nurse consultant within the Division of Policy and Data clinical quality branch. I'm also joined by my colleague, Nicole Viviana, a ORISE fellow within the division. Thank you for joining us for such an important topic. A few logistical points about this presentation. We will have ample time for questions and answers at the end, so feel free to add your questions to the chat. A moderator will facilitate the process. In addition, a link will be added within the the chat box so that you can access for your programmatic needs. And we hope that you enjoy the presentation. Next slide. The Health Resources and Service Administration, HRSA, supports more than 90 programs that provide health care to people who are geographically isolated or economically or medically challenged through grants and cooperative agreements and serves tens of millions of people. Next slide. Given the rapid changes in healthcare and the ending the HIV epidemic in the U.S. initiative, along with the release of the National HIV AIDS Strategy, HAB has refreshed the vision and mission. The updates ensure that both our mission and vision are forward-looking and acknowledges the ultimate goal of ending the HIV epidemic in the U.S. and what HAB needs to do to get there while continuing to provide the quality HIV care of the Ryan White programs that current and newly diagnosed people with HIV need. We want to underscore that we wouldn't be able to achieve our vision or mission without the support of all of you who are carrying out this important work each day. Next slide. Chris's Ryan White Programs provides a comprehensive system of HIV primary medical care, medications, and essential support services for low-income people with HIV. Funds are granted to states, cities, counties, and local community-based organizations to improve health outcomes and reduce HIV transmission. Provided services to nearly 500 and 62,000 people in 2020, of which more than half of all of people with diagnosed HIV in the U.S. are accounted for. 89.4% of Ryan White clients receiving HIV medical care were virally suppressed in 2020, exceeding the national average of 65.5%. Next slide. I, myself, Tracy Gant, nor my colleague, Nicole Viviana, have any relevant financial or non-financial interest to disclose. Next slide. For this aging session, the learning objectives include the following. The participant will be able to describe the multidisciplinary approach and factors to geriatric care that help to achieve the successful integration of geriatric services into routine HIV care. Identify geriatric care and treatment recommended for persons with HIV age 50 years and above that are integrated into the Ryan White programs and describe the models 
to integrate geriatric services. I will now turn it over to Nicole to briefly review some Ryan White data. Next slide. Thank you, Tracy. Detailed demographic data pertaining to HIV and aging was reviewed in session 101 of the Aging Institute. But for the current session 201, I will briefly go over Ryan White HIV and AIDS program data pertaining to age groups. In 2020, 47.9% of the 561,514 clients served by the Ryan White HIV and AIDS program were 50 years of age or, or older. Among this group, 13.3% were 50 to 54, 14.6% were 55 to 59, 10.5% were 60 to 64, and 9.5% were 65 years or older. Again, that's almost 50% of the client population served by the Ryan White HIV and AIDS program that were 50 years of age or older. Thanks, Nicole. In 2022, HRSA released three NOPOs entitled Emerging Strategies to Improve HIV Health Outcomes for People Aging with HIV. HRSA 22027 focused on one cooperative agreement which was recently awarded to Health Research Institute of New York, functioning as the capacity provider for the provisions of technical assistance to all of, re of the recipients. I will function as the project officer. HRSA 22029 focused on one cooperative agreement, which was recently awarded to National Opinion Research Center of Chicago, functioning as the evaluation provider of the overall project. And this will be managed by Tracy McClare as the project officer. And HRSA 22028 focused on 10 grant recipients to various recipients regionally across the US to function as demonstration sites to identify, demonstrate, refine, and assess emerging strategies to the dissemination of best practices. As the projects progress, Further information will be shared on an aging landing page on Target HIV. Please visit the page for valuable content. I will turn it back to Nicole to introduce our expert guest. Nicole. Thanks, Tracy. Session 201 of the Aging Institute sought out an expert in the field of co-management of HIV and geriatric care community currently immersed within a Ryan White HIV care clinic. Our goal was to invite the expert guest to explore the process of integration, the multidisciplinary team approach, the successes of co-management, and some of the challenges to anticipate and overcome in the HIV and aging world. Our expert guest today is Dr. Jacob Walker. Dr. Walker is a geriatrician and HIV specialist at the University of Colorado, having recently moved to Denver from Chicago. Through the Ryan White program at the University of Chicago, Dr. Walker oversaw one of the few HIV and aging clinics in the Midwest. The program provides integrated HIV primary care for adults over 50, a model he'll be replicating in Colorado. And now I'll turn it over to Dr. Walker. Thanks, Nicole. Uh, brief disclosures, I have received consulting fees from Janssen and Simpson Healthcare. We're not going to be discussing any specific products or investigational experimental treatments today. To review our learning objectives quickly, uh, by the end of this activity, I'm hopeful that everyone uh, listening can learn a little bit more about the role of a geriatrician and what aspects of geriatric care we can integrate into Ryan White clinics, as well as some common geriatric screening and assessments that we can use that are easily adaptable to other sites. These two learning objectives are going to make up the first half of the talk, and we're going to close out the second half uh, discussing some of the models to integrate geriatric services into Ryan White clinics. Next slide. Please visit the link if you would like to receive continuing education credit for this activity. So briefly, for those who haven't spent a lot of time with geriatrics, here's some Geriatrics 101 for our HIV and Aging 201 talk. Uh, geriatricians specialize in the medical care of all older adults. Now, age is just a number. People can feel young at 95, they can feel old at 52. Often for geriatricians, older means greater than 65, the average retirement age in the US. Um, but we'll often use 50 years of age or older as our cutoff in HIV care, because this is a relatively new segment of the population that is growing quickly. 
And if you've uh, attended our uh, HIV and Aging 101 talk, you know that we start to see geriatric syndrome onset a little bit earlier in older adults living with HIV. So 50 is the cutoff often used in HIV and aging as an older adult. Uh, geriatrics is highly focused on function. Function is king. Um, and that is because as we age, we acquire medical comorbidities, we become physiologically complex, and our care begins to uh, take on a whole lot of new aspects uh, like extra medications, extra diagnoses, uh, need for assistance with uh, ADLs and IADLs, uh, and focusing on function really helps us organize all of that. Geriatrics is a multi-site specialty. We operate in home, uh, at the hospital, in nursing homes, in assisted livings, really all across our social networks. Wherever patients may go, we follow them there. Uh, and of course, it is grounded in, per in person-centered care, uh, much like the care happening at Ryan White Clinics. Next slide, please. Again, in case you've never interacted with a lot of geriatricians, uh, geriat geriatricians, uh, or at least as MDs and DOs, are usually internal medicine or family medicine trained physicians who uh, undergo a one-year fellowship. But geriatric specialization can happen in a lot of different fields. There are specialty certificate programs in pharmacy, social work, uh, and for advanced practice nurses, this is not a full list. There are geriatric psychiatrists, dentists, physical therapists. There's a lot of ways that people can build upon uh, a foundation of medicine to focus on, focus their work on older adults. What I want to emphasize though is that even though all of these geriatric specialists are great, wonderful people to know, any care team member can be trained in basic geriatric screening and assessments. So you do not need a geriatrician to provide excellent geriatric care in your clinic. Um, because there are so few people with these specializations, care team education is really a primary role of geriatric specialists. So becoming an educator and a teacher uh, for healthcare systems is where a lot of these specialists are functioning. Next slide, please. I'm gonna make two big points about why geriatricians as educators are so key. The first is that there aren't a lot of us. Uh, we have the lowest match rate of any specialty uh, in, in the field of medicine, uh, with about 50% of all fellowship spots going filled in any given year. So there aren't a lot of geriatricians to go around despite the rapid aging of the US population. Next slide. And again, if you went to our uh, HIV and Aging 101 talk, you know that a, a big reason this matters in the HIV world is there are now over 8 million people uh, over the age of 50 living with HIV worldwide, and that number has doubled in the last decade. Next slide, please. Um, so for this first half, again, we're going to talk about some of the ways that you can integrate geriatrics with or without a geriatrician into Ryan White Clinics. And I want to use, uh, go through these uh, tools and skills through the frame of the four M's. Uh, four M's, which are also, again, reviewed in our 101 talk, are what matters most, medication, mentation, and mobility. Uh, these are you know, a program for age-friendly health systems run by the John A. Hartford Foundation and the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. They're really useful as a larger health system framework to decide if our hospital system or clinic system is providing age-friendly care. But it's also pretty useful as a framework for HIV-specific implementation because these same four M's apply just as well. Uh, now, others have advocated for additions to the four M's, perhaps there should be five or six, adding thing, themes like multi-complexity, multi-morbidity, modifiability, and I'm always trying to figure out how to shoehorn osteoporosis into one of those four M's. Um, so we'll talk about a little bit more than just these four as we go through our geriatric toolkits. Next slide. To start us off, I want to highlight kind of two different approaches to integrating geriatrics into care. One is through the comprehensive geriatric assessment. This is often what people think about when they think about uh, sending someone to see a geriatrician or a geriatric consultation. This is a detailed, multidisciplinary diagnostic and therapeutic assessment that takes a long time. I will spend anywhere between 60 and 90 minutes doing a comprehensive geriatric assessment. Um, and it's designed to create a comprehensive care plan. It's very high value. You can come up with a lot to do for a patient in one of those very long visits um, with multiple team members, but this adds a lot of cost. It takes time. It often takes more than one person, tough to organize, but it can be really great for highly complex patients. So on our like impact matrix to the right, comprehensive geriatric assessments can kind of qualify as a major project. It can be tough for most clinics to perform. 
Uh, what I think is going to make the most sense for many listeners on this call is targeted geriatric screening. This is going to be handpicking the elements of the comprehensive geriatric assessment that are most important to you and to your uh, patients. They can be adaptable to unique populations and applicable to people outside of uh, the traditionally older age range, uh, these become very high value and a much lower cost. So we're a bit more feasible for most of us and kind of fall into that quick win category. That's what we're gonna focus on, uh, but all of these targeted geriatric screening elements are things that go into a comprehensive geriatric assessment. Next slide, please. We'll start our first M off with mobility. Um, mobility is often the one, of the four Ms, the one that ends up being uh, most commonly addressed, I think, in the geriatric clinic, um, is very high importance for patients. A high, high priority area of mobility screening in geriatrics is fall screening. Uh, there are a lot of ways to go about this. The simplest that I find is through using the American Geriatric Society's fall screening questionnaire, which is just three questions. Uh, have you fallen two or more times in the last year? Do you have trouble with balance? And are you afraid of falling? A yes to any of those questions indicates a particularly high risk of falls within the next year and should prompt further evaluation. Uh, there are a lot of different pathways you can go through uh, in this evaluation, whether that includes uh, asking more follow-up questions, medication review, more thorough physical exam, referral to therapy, etc. There's a lot that a lot that can cascade from this questionnaire, but identifying those highest risk patients is going to be your best way uh, to address fall risk in older adults. Next slide, please. Some brief screening tools for anyone who is at high risk of falls that you could use to follow this up. that are easy to do in, in uh, any clinic setting. First is the timed up and go. This is a three meter walk test uh, from sitting from chair, walking three meters away, walking back and sitting back down. The time that it takes someone to do that uh, can reveal uh, pretty significant Risk of, risk of fall as well as any other new mobility problems you might not have picked up on and there are standard times uh, that you can look up for that. Uh, there are also, uh, if someone, especially if someone cannot walk very far or you don't have the space to walk in a hallway or a long room, you can do 30 seconds of chair stand. The number of times someone's able to stand independently from a chair in 30 seconds uh, can help tell you a lot about their fall risk. Uh, grip strength using a dynamometer uh, pictured in the lower right corner is one nice way, uh, especially for those who are in, uh, cannot ambulate on their own, uh, to get a brief assessment of overall strength and mobility. And then we have slightly longer tests like the short physical performance battery that take about 10-15 minutes that can be done again in any clinic setting without uh, really any equipment. Uh, there are far more mobility screening tools than just these four. These are some of the shortest and most uh, frequently used in geriatrics. I highly encourage you all to check out the CDC's study program, which compiles screening tools and resources and flow sheets and algorithms for how to address fall risks in older adults, including uh, resources that patients can use in the home. They have a really great website, um, which we can put in the chat. Next slide. A big part of mobility is uh, equipment, uh, as well as the physical built environment. One way to geriatricize our Ryan White clinics is to make sure that we're creating accessible clinic spaces. This does not just apply to older adults, but any younger adult who may be having mobility problems. Consider things such as high contrast lighting, uh, handrails in the hallways, grab bars in the bathroom, armrests for exam tables and waiting room chairs. These are all gonna make it easier for people to avoid tripping and falling and to make it easier to get up and down from chairs. Um, make sure that for your patients who are in wheelchairs that you have things like a wheelchair accessible scale, uh, wide enough doorways, wide enough clinic rooms, um, and then accessible parking. Uh, parking is a huge, huge concern for people with mobility problems. Um, also consider that many of these equipment changes uh, may be necessary in a patient's home. They may not know about the things that are out there like shower chairs, uh, raised toilet seats, rails for toilet seats, um, lifts, canes, walkers, etc. Um, not every piece of durable medical equipment is going to be covered by insurance, but many are, and it's going to be helpful to ensure that we have pathways for durable med medical equipment ordering for any of our patients who may need extra equipment in the home as they age. Um, it can make a huge difference in someone's life just getting them something like a four-prone cane or a shower chair. Next slide, please. 
in trying to promote mobility for our older adults, uh, exercise becomes king. I like to tell my patients that I worry a little bit less about what you're eating as you get older and much, much more about how you're moving your body. Um, we believe that resistance-based exercise, Tai Chi, and mixed modality exercise that combines uh, things like cardio and resistance in one are likely the best for promoting functional, um, promoting function as we age. Um, but it's easier said than done. A lot of us like to think that we exercise a lot more than we do. Um, and for those aging with HIV, stigma and finances may further limit access to uh, exercise programs. There are a lot out there though. Programs like Silver Sneakers funded through Medicare um, and even specific programs for adults living with HIV or LGBTQ older adults um, may create nice access points for us. I wanna highlight a picture there is Margaret Danilovich who is at CJE Senior Life in Chicago, runs several programs virtually, uh, specifically targeting uh, older adults with HIV for virtual exercise programs. They're quite wonderful. Um, but finding champions like that in the physical and occupational therapy world can really help um, limit those barriers to exercise for our patients. So try to create strong relationships with a physical or occupational therapy office if you don't have them within your own health system. If you do, make sure they know that you want them to be involved, that you want them to uh, be helping out with your patients. Um, it can be helpful to also identify local low-cost programs, such as local community centers. Um, your area agency on aging may be able to help you identify some of these if you don't want to come up with a list on your own. Um, and then it can be helpful also to prescribe exercise plans. Uh, it sounds silly, but writing down an exercise plan uh, on an after-visit summary or a prescription pad can really help someone know what they need to be doing uh, on their own in the community. And, and then one last plug for our therapists is that you would be surprised if you don't have on-site physical and occupational therapy. I'm constantly surprised how much therapists are able to do with very little equipment and very little space. So if you think that it's just a no-go, you'll never be able to have therapists on site, um, talk to one of them. See if you can find ways to get them to come even just a few days a week. Uh, you may be able to convert an old conference room uh, into a physical therapy gym with less effort than you anticipate. Next slide, please. All right. So that's mobility. Let's move on to our second of the four M's, uh, which is one that I care quite a bit about, which is medications. Um, for those who have been practicing for a long time, we know that antiviral therapy for HIV infection used to be one of the worst polypharmacy offenders out there, uh, up to 20 pills a day taken at different intervals. And today we are very, very blessed to have uh, more advanced antiretroviral therapies that may be as little as one pill a day or even injections periodically. Um, in this new era of uh, antiretroviral therapy, non-HIV medications now dominate pill burden. A lot of reasons geriatricians hate pill burden and polypharmacy, which is that more meds add to worse adherence, worsen costs, um, increased risk of adverse events and toxicity. Uh, if you move on to the next uh, animation here, I have a, a chart showing how across studies, about 30 to 70 percent of patients are prescribed meds with at least a moderate interaction. This particular graph is from a sample of 89 adults over age 60 in the UCSF HIV over 60 cohort. If you took all medications into account, almost 100 percent had polypharmacy, which they defined as five or more meds, because that is where uh, adherence really starts to falter is once you get past five meds. Even if you take out HIV medications, about 70% were still experiencing polypharmacy. More than half had a major drug drug interaction. More than half had a potentially inappropriate medication as measured using the uh, beers list, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, and about a fifth uh, had a high risk uh, on the anticholinergic risk scale score. So even as we move away from high HIV related pill burden, patients still have a very high overall pill burden and those extra medications can really lead to bad downstream effects. Next slide, please. Um, here are some of the tools that I use to help address medications in the HIV clinic. Um, the first is the brown bag review. It is a classic. You ask your patients to bring in all of your medications, uh, sometimes in a brown bag, which is where the name comes from. Um, and you'd be surprised how many different ways your patients are taking their medications. Uh, this lovely Spider-Man pill box to the right is about how my father-in-law takes his pills. They're all just jumbled together in one uh, bottle, uh, which can be very revealing, especially someone where you're worried about adherence. You suddenly find out maybe they don't have the pills that they need. Maybe they have duplicates or multiple doses. 
it's best if you can see what pills the patient actually has. So asking people to bring things in for a brown bag review is very helpful. This can often be done either with a clinician, a nurse, or a pharmacist. There's no uh, best way to, to do it. Um, move forward. Um, once you know what a patient is actually taking, it's good to assess medication risk. One of the most common tools we use in the US is the beers list. This is put together by the American Geriatric Society and updated about every three to five years. Um, it is a very long list. They make little pocket cards that are very helpful uh, in the clinic that divide medications by class and by indication. An example to the right is uh, if you go by indication and look at someone who is having syncope, there is a list of drugs that are commonly prescribed in older adults that may increase the risk of syncope, such as TCAs, uh, certain antipsychotics, acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, uh, or non-selective alpha blockers. Um, and they will give tips for each class uh, or each indication, as well as uh, sources. So if you've never seen the beers list, it's worth taking a glance at and maybe worth uh, acquiring some pocket cards for use in your clinic. Um, another that is not pictured is the anticholinergic risk scale. This is a, a smaller scale that applies point values to high risk medications in older adults. As we age, we are much more uh, vulnerable to the anticholinergic effects of medications. Um, and this can be used to kind of grade the overall risk of a patient's medication list to identify those in whom we need to really be focused on deprescribing. Um, all across the beers list in the anticholinergic risk scale, you will find drugs that are especially high risk of drug drug interactions. Move forward in the uh, animation. You'll find one of my favorites. If you've never seen this, please start using it. It's going to change your life. Uh, H, not to make too many wild promises. Um, it's HIVDrugInteractions.org. It is run by the University of Liverpool. Uh, they have both a web and a mobile app uh, in which you can place in patients uh, HIV medications as well as any co-medications, and it will give you a list of potential drug-drug interactions as well as citations for the studies that uh, inform those interactions. Very, very helpful. I use it regularly um, in my practice. But there are a lot of other drug-drug interaction checkers out there, including Lexicomp. Um, this one is just very specific to HIV and has a very nice user interface. So I encourage you to check it out and I encourage you to use some sort of interaction checker or ask your pharmacist to review uh, medications for interactions uh, periodically for any, really any patient, especially those on uh, five or more meds. Um, great ways to help uh, ensure that we are getting an accurate med list without drug ring interactions, without high risk medications, is to find a way to standardize medication reviews. This can be done again by just about any type of clinician, nursing, medical assistant, pharmacist, physician. Um, but for working it into your clinic workflow is a way to make sure that it does not get missed. That's one of the biggest reasons that people develop these long medication lists is that nobody's reviewing them. So whether that's an annual review or a review for all new patients, find a way to standardize and operationalize med reviews. Um, HIV clinics are often blessed. They usually have much better access to specialty pharmacists than we do in geriatrics. So we take advantage of that and involve your pharmacist in uh, your med medication review process or in creating those workflows can be very, very helpful. Next slide, please. All right, moving on to M number three, mentation. Um, as a geriatric consultant within an HIV clinic, I would say that this is probably the most common reason that I get involved in a patient's care, which is cognitive and mood disorders. They are both a very common problem as we age, and it's in HIV a very common barrier to viral suppression, uh, resulting in a, a very common reason for geriatric deferral. As a reminder from our 101 talk, uh, there's a wide range of ways that mentation can impact those with HIV. Um, those aging with HIV are still at risk of Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia and may even carry a greater number of shared risk factors for those more common dementias. We also have to consider HIV-associated neurocognitive disorder, which is a wide-ranging syndrome uh, that can most often include a mild degree of cognitive impairment, not impacting function, but can cause uh, moderate to severe dementia in some patients. Um, rates of hand are as high as 30%, even in the ART era, though we see less often uh, the more severe HIV-associated dementias, mild cognitive impairment resulting from HIV um, is still quite common and can impact both viral suppression, function, and just overall quality of life. Um, again, as a reminder, hand is uh, characterized by subcortical dysfunction with attention concentration impairment, often comorbid depressive symptoms, 
um, and impaired psychomotor speed and precision. It looks a little bit different from other dementias like Alzheimer's and vascular disease, but can be very difficult to tease out. Um, and it's most common in those with lower CD4 nadirs and longer periods of vibrivia. Next slide. Um, in screening for hand or any uh, cognitive impairment in our older adults with HIV, testing is warranted really only if there are signs and symptoms. We've not found great evidence that universal cognitive screening for all adults um, is particularly helpful. It's going to be those in which we suspect a problem or who come to us concerned about a problem. Uh, there are really two tools that uh, I want listeners to focus on here. There are dozens out there. They're all great. I don't want to fault anyone who's using any other tools, but if you haven't done any cognitive screening before, uh, the two that are most useful in Ryan White clinics, I think, are going to be the MINICOG and the MOCA. The MINICOG is a uh, very brief cognitive screening tool. It is a three-item recall and a clock draw. So you ask someone to remember three items, make them draw a clock, uh, with a specific time, and then ask those three items again. An abnormal score on the MINICOG simply tells you that there is a high likelihood that there is something wrong and prompts further testing. It is not useful for diagnosis, but it's very great for screening because it is so short. And then it is included in the Medicare Annual Wellness Visit template. Um, if you are more concerned and want to uh, work up cognitive impairment <coughs> in a bit more detail, of all the office-based testing options out there, like the MMSE or the slums, the MOCA is probably the preferred in HIV. Um, it takes about 10 to 15 minutes, and many clinicians will already be familiar with it. Um, the reason it is preferred is that it is probably more sensitive for HIV-associated neurocognitive disorder than some of our other options. This is because it has a bit more uh, in the visual, spatial, and executive function field. So it's a bit more difficult, thus more sensitive, and includes more cognitive domains than the others. Um, one thing I really want to point out about mentation is that uh, it often falls into this trap of people, people tend to think that, oh, I need to send someone to a neurologist or a psychologist to do any kind of this cognitive screening. Um, and I want to make sure people know that really any staff member can be trained to perform these cognitive tests. Um, the MINICOG is very, very simple, requires really no training. Um, the MOCA requires a little bit of background knowledge. There are plenty of training courses out there and even certificates that you can get uh, to show that you know what you're doing. Um, but this does not always have to take up 10 to 15 minutes of the clinician's time in the visit. It can be a separate uh, visit with a nurse or a social worker. As long as that person's comfortable performing the MOCA, uh, you can set up separate clinic visits for this. So a lot of ways to incorporate clinic or cognitive screening in the clinic that does not require you spending an entire visit with the patient. Next slide, please. So, once you've identified that something is wrong, um, that there is cognitive impairment present, um, or if you are making a diagnosis of dementia, the subsequent workup and management is hard. It requires a really complex network of support that not all Ryan White clinics are going to be like realistically able to do. It's the, you know, don't beat yourself up about this. Dementia is one of the hardest things to tackle in medicine. Um, it can include referring people for advanced neuroimaging, referring people for neuropsych testing, referrals to specialty clinics like geriatrics, neurology, or geriatric psychiatry. And it can include some more advanced therapy options, including cognitive therapy or OT driving assessments. And then it often involves um, bringing in all of your uh, outside resources from your area agency on aging, local community organizations, sometimes adult protective services. Um, it's, it's a complex network that can be really tough to tackle in any clinic setting. Um, if you are in a larger clinic or a well-resourced clinic, there may be ways for you to uh, send patients for neuroimaging or neuropsych testing. You may already have uh, processes set up for many of these, which is great. If you spot any on this list that you've never heard of or unfamiliar with, investigate whether maybe there are ways that your patients can easily access these. Um, if you think that uh, tackling all of these points is going to be well beyond your clinic's means, then I want you to look at that last question, which is, do you have an access point for dementia care services? Whether that is a local geriatrics or memory clinic, whether that is a contact through your area agency on aging, if you have someone with more moderate to severe dementia who needs a lot more help, do you have an access point for dementia care services that you can take advantage of? And if not, great to start looking. Next slide, please. Um, I don't want to neglect amongst the imitation category uh, mood disorders, which are very important in older adults and very common across the entire lifespan. 
Um, one nice thing about mood disorder screening in geriatrics is that it is very similar to younger adults. Both depression and anxiety screening, you can rely on some of the same common tools that many of you likely use already, including the PHQ-2, the PHQ-9, or the GAD-7. These are all validated in older adults and still very useful. Um, it is worth noting that older adults, especially with depression, may present with more somatic complaints or with memory impairment. Um, the geriatric depression scale is one additional screening tool that may be helpful uh, to keep on hand. It's a bit of a longer questionnaire. I think it's 20 questions. Don't quote me on that. Um, but includes a lot more questions about somatic symptoms uh, that elder adults may present with instead. Um, another nice thing about these is that electronic versions are available. They can often be completed outside of visits through a patient portal. Um, in one study that uh, I helped work on looking at uh, depression screening through a patient portal, uh, we get this great quote from a patient saying, I, I hid my anxiety for a long time. I was ashamed. I was afraid of talking about it. And it was not easy to open up to a doctor. So if I could do it through the chart and know that I'm going to get the right help, it would probably be a lot easier for me to do so, uh, which was just wonderful to hear. It's uh, a constant reminder that there's more than one ways uh, to solve any problem in healthcare. And so thinking about other uh, ways to incorporate depression, anxiety screening into your clinic beyond just uh, an MA asking for the visit or a clinician asking during the visit, um, you can pick up on quite a bit of uh, mood disorders in our older adults with HIV. Um, once you have screened and identified patients at high risk or who are experiencing anxiety and depression, uh, ensure that they have access to counseling and psychiatry services, which in that same study was one of the biggest concerns that our patients had, is if I do any of these tests, am I gonna be able to get the help that I need? Um, it can be very tough uh, in our healthcare landscape. Uh, I'm sure many of you already have someone in mind who you can help send patients to um, who are dealing with more severe mood disorders. Next slide. Moving into our fourth M, which is what matters most. Um, this can be a sort of catch-all category in our four Ms because a lot of things matter to our patients. Uh, but it's really meant to focus on things like advanced care planning, end of life planning, um, and overall quality of life. I want to hone in on one aspect of advanced care planning um, that I think is probably most important and most applicable to people in uh, every state, um, which is designation of a medical power of attorney. Uh, the use of advanced directives, so written documents like the medical power of attorney or like a documented code status, is widely variable amongst HIV clinics. And from study to study, it's anywhere between eight to 47%. Um, local practice is all over the place, um, which makes sense because it is difficult. Um, if you're gonna focus on any one thing, I prefer that it be the medical power of attorney because it is very simple. Um, in the vast majority of states, it only requires a witness, a notary or a lawyer. And if you can identify who someone's special person is, who their medical power of attorney is, then other conversations such as uh, documentation of a living will, decisions around hospitalization, decisions around code status become much, much easier, especially if that patient becomes incapacitated. Um, another great reason to make sure that all of your patients, regardless of age, have a medical power of attorney um, is that it's, you know, it's easy to perform. It doesn't have to be a clinician. It can be a social worker, a nurse, an MA, a community health worker. There are state to state, very, very few rules. I'm not aware of any states would even require like a physician signature for a medical power of attorney. Um, but if you are going to involve any of your clinicians, uh, physicians, NPs, PAs, and nurse specialists can actually bill for advanced care planning. So if you want to set up uh, a workflow to help improve advanced care planning within your clinic, um, there are ways to get reimbursed for that, which is great. Um, worth checking out. Uh, I'm staying kind of vague in the what matters most because states are very different. So worth checking out what uh, documentation is available in your state um, and which forms it's gonna be helpful to keep on hand. Next slide, please. Um, more complex goals of care conversations, again, about things like hospitalization, location of care, end of life care. These take a lot of time and often require physician input. It can be really hard to create workflows around. So I'm not gonna try to fix one of the more complex problems in healthcare in this talk, uh, but I do wanna point to one really nice resource if you are thinking about this or wanna uh, figure out how you can address um, advanced care planning a little bit better with your patients. 
Um, and that's ePrognosis. It is a wonderful website. We'll put the link in the chat uh, run by uh, the ger geriatrics group at UCSF. Um, it includes a broad compilation of tools to guide conversations around things like cancer screening, prognosis, how we communicate prognosis, um, and mortality risk. Uh, quite a bit of calculators on there uh, and worth checking out if you've never used it before. Next slide, please. Um, what I find often matters the most to my patients, going back and roping in some of the uh, points from the mobility section, um, is that it's their day-to-day -day function, how they're living their life outside of the clinic walls. Um, functional screening done on initial visits or perhaps on annual reviews um, can quickly identify what's actually the most important medical condition to any given patient. They can identify what is impairing your ability to live your life and perform your ADLs or your IADLs pictured to the right. And patients with greater functional deficits are also gonna be those at highest risk for poor outcomes, both for medical comorbidities as well as um, social vulnerability. Uh, if you want to put a score to the activities of daily living, there is something called the CATS index where you apply points to each of these. But I find it most helpful just to include this list of ADLs, nine ADLs, and a note template and go through them every once in a while with my patients to see what's changed. It uh, doesn't have to be done by uh, a clinician. Patients can also self-complete uh, on a questionnaire, just asking, do you need help with any of the following, yes or no? Um, there are other tools out there, such as the uh, ECOG score or Karnofsky performance score, uh, looking at functional, uh, functional ability in patients. I find those are a little less useful in primary care at identifying uh, intervenable problems. Uh, again, consider including functional screening in any new patient visit or annual review because you'd be surprised how much these change and you'd be surprised how often functional deficits start to pop up in patients in their 40s and 50s, um, which is often when we first see that first loss of ADL or IDL. It's not necessarily those aging into their 70s and beyond. Uh, next slide, please. Hand in hand with functional loss is sensory loss. This is often a very uh, high value uh, area of screening for our older adults. And for those in primary care clinics can be a really nice, easy win because you identify a vision problem, you send somebody to the eye doctor, you identify a hearing problem, you get somebody to an audiologist. Um, it's quite easy for a lot of clinicians in primary care to grasp solutions to these. Um, vision loss is really straightforward. Just screen, ask your patients what type of vision problems they have, perform a wall chart based uh, or Snell, Snell and chart based testing. Um, make sure you have a list of local eye care providers if they're not within your own system that you can refer people to, um, and make sure that you have contact information for your state agency for the blind. Every state has one, uh, and they can hook people up with quite a few interesting resources, um, ranging from books on tape, driving aids, uh, home care, the list goes on and on. There's quite a bit out there. It's just kind of hard to find initially if you're not familiar with these services. Um, and then in hearing loss, again, screen, just ask patients if they have trouble hearing. Um, most are going to be able to tell you yes or no. You might have to repeat yourself a few times, though. Uh, it's helpful to provide hearing amplification devices during visits. Uh, pictured in the bottom right is one such device. They are a uh, pair of headphones hooked up to a microphone, and they can make a world of difference. One of my favorite things to do in my job. Uh, they're about 100 and 150 bucks online uh, and are a great alternative to hearing aids for patients who cannot afford them. Um, it's also helpful uh, as we age, we tend to build up a lot of wax uh, to create some sort of ear cleaning protocol. Uh, usually this is going to fall under the purview of medical assistants or nurses. Um, but creating an option for patients to come in for a quick visit, just like they might for a vaccine to get their ears cleaned out, uh, can be great. They can uh, get everything done in one place without having to go see an EMT uh, just to clean out a little wax. Um, but for those patients with more severe hearing loss who may need hearing aids or more advanced interventions, again, make sure we're identifying local specialists such as audiologists or uh, EMT clinics uh, that can accept our patients. Next slide, please. Uh, and here's the uh, unfortunate outlier in my four M's, is osteoporosis. I don't want to leave uh, without talking about it. Um, risk of fracture may double uh, in older adults with HIV. It is recommended that men and women begin, with HIV begin screening for osteoporosis around age 50, sooner if uh, people experience earlier menopause or fragility fracture. Uh, the great thing about osteoporosis is that screening is pretty straightforward and treatment is also 
pretty straightforward in most cases. We need to be replacing vitamin D, offering bisphosphonates, encouraging calcium intake and exercise. Um, in HIV, it may require an antiretroviral therapy switch, uh, depending on what drug someone has been on and for how long. Uh, but what I find most often in, in my practice is that this just gets missed, especially in men, especially in younger women. We just don't think about osteoporosis screening as much. Um, if you move on to the next slide here, um, one nice sort of thing to do is to incorporate osteoporosis screening into your routine health maintenance tracking systems. It's often left off uh, EMR-based tracking systems because it's sort of HIV patients are sort of a special category of risk. Um, but including it like with your vaccinations, with cancer screening as something on your list of health maintenance items will help keep it from getting missed. Um, one way that we can more quantify someone's risk is with the FRAX tool or Fracture Risk Assessment tool. It's run by the University of Sheffield. Uh, simple calculator, you put in patients uh, height, weight, and osteoporosis risk factors, which does not include HIV. It can give you a rough, rough estimate of their 10-year risk of fracture uh, or major osteoporotic fracture um, and help guide the urgency with which you need someone to be uh, placed on therapy. And it can also help guide the urgency with which you need to send someone to see an endocrinologist or other specialist in bone health if someone has especially complex risk factors, multiple fractures, or very high osteoporosis risk. It is probably going to be most useful for them to see a specialist. So make sure that you have some sort of access uh, to an endocrinologist, a geriatrician, or other fracture uh, specialist from your health system. Next slide, please. All right, so that's been our whirlwind of many geriatrics tools and assessments, kind of what I'm going through in my head when I'm doing a geriatric assessment in the HIV clinic. The second half of the talk is going to focus on the models of integrated care. Uh, geriatric primary care is a multidisciplinary team that includes nurses, MPs, MDs, social workers, behavioral health. If we're lucky, we have a pharmacist and a counselor, uh, but it's a whole giant team. And one of the nicest things about HIV care, if you move on to the, the next animation, is that it is mostly the same. Like most Ryan White clinics are going to have access to a lot of the same skilled professionals. Uh, again, I think Ryan White clinics are probably even more likely to have access to pharmacy care than in a geriatric clinic. And we can really take advantage of that to ensure that patients are getting good geriatric care. Next slide, please. One thing that can make integrated care a little bit difficult in the HIV world is the question of who is the primary care provider. There's a lot of variability between health systems, uh, rates of patients with HIV identifying their HIV specialists as their PCP uh, range from 20 to 60 percent, depending on the system. This matters a bit because if you look at quality metric performance on variables like hypertension or diabetes, whether we're meeting our goals uh, for management, it does vary depending on what type of uh, provider is managing someone's primary care. And it's not to say that an HIV specialist or strictly a primary care doctor is better or worse, but there are differences. Um, regardless of what your system looks like or who the PCPs are in your system, Patients assign a very high value to HIV specialists across all qualitative studies and very often voice a preference for integrated chronic disease management. So HIV specialists should and will ultimately play an important role in uh, providing primary care or linking people to primary care and that includes geriatrics uh, because patients assign such a high value to all of you for all the work that you're doing. Next slide, please. I'm going to spend a little bit more time on this slide. This are some of our models of integrated care, um, kind of ranging from least integrated to most. Uh, first is geriatric consultation. I will talk about one example of this in a future slide. This is when we send our patients to see a geriatrician or have a geriatrician come to see our patients, usually for a comprehensive geriatric assessment or maybe a couple, just a couple of visits um, to provide input on uh, successful aging. Uh, this is often a low cost means of integrating geriatric care. You just have to identify a geriatrician who can see patients in either the same site or elsewhere. Um, it usually doesn't require a lot of additional um, pathways, no extra hiring, you just have to find a geriatrician. Um, patients often like this model, but may be a little bit reluctant to go to another clinic um, or maybe reluctant to see a geriatrician, especially if they're in their 50s and they just don't feel like they're old or need to see an aging specialist. Um, slightly more integrated is geriatric HIV co-management. This is where a geriatrician is usually on site within the same uh, clinic building, um, managing chronic medical conditions alongside an HIV specialist. So you may split the visits every other visit. You may see the geriatrician every third visit. 
the geriatrician may function as the primary care provider as we start spacing out HIV uh, specialist visits. Uh, this is going to be a good model when you have easy access to geriatrics, but you have geriatricians that don't have any HIV experience or uh, HIV specialists who don't have a lot of primary care or geriatric experience. Um, what I practice is a, the dually trained provider model. This is someone who has both HIV training and geriatrics training. Um, I like it. It works well. It can be very flexible. Sometimes I serve as a consultant, sometimes as the primary HIV specialist, but there are very few people with dual training. So it's a much harder thing to create um, in most healthcare systems. Um, the more realistic model for most clinics is going to be the integrated geriatric assessment model. Uh, this is using all those tools we just talked about within routine uh, HIV clinic care. One nice way to do this is through the Medicare annual wellness visit program. Uh, this is a covered service under Medicare in which uh, patients receive an annual health screening going over uh, usual care items like vaccination and blood pressure, but the Medicare annual wellness visit template does include a lot of geriatric screening items, including cognitive and functional screening. Uh, but there are lots of other ways that you can integrate the geriatric tools that we talked about in previous slides uh, into your clinic workflow. So that's one way to do it without a specially trained provider. Um, then we have the model that many Ryan White clinics follow, which is a combined primary care HIV clinic in which the HIV specialists are first and foremost uh, internists or family medicine uh, trained and can do full spectrum of care, including HIV, not necessarily um, as ID specialists, but as generalists with extra HIV training. Um, and then some more exploratory models of integrated care include uh, one that I'm particularly interested in, which is Embedded Champions. Uh, trying to identify staff members within your clinic who may have special interest in the care of older adults who want to learn a little bit more without going through formal fellowship or certificate training um, and can serve as sort of the guidepost and the resource linkage person uh, for all things aging related. Um, and then there are ways to integrate telehealth. Um, if you don't live, especially in a rural area, a smaller city without a lot of geriatricians, um, are there ways that we can explore geriatric assessments virtually uh, with uh, providers who may be further away. If you are in a larger system and if you have uh, access to geriatricians or know a geriatrician uh, or other geriatric specialists, uh, it is worth getting a hold of them and seeing what they're doing in other specialties. Um, again, there aren't a lot of geriatricians, so most of us are doing some sort of educational work or integrated clinical work rather than uh, our own freestanding geriatrics clinics. Um, in fields such as geriatric oncology, geriatric surgery, transplant surgery, and especially dementia care and memory clinics, you'll find geriatricians doing a lot of uh, unique integrated models that you may be able to replicate within the Ryan White Clinic. So if you have access to geriatrics or know someone in your system, it's worth uh, asking them what kind of integrated care they're providing elsewhere in case you can replicate that. Next slide, please. We go through just a couple examples of uh, integrated care that I've been a part of. Um, first is the way we have been doing things at the University of Colorado. A few years ago, we set up, uh, I shouldn't say we, Christine Erlinson and Scotty Church, pictured here, um, spearheaded the positive aging consultation uh, model. This is a, a consultation model in which patients in the HIV, in the Ryan White Clinic, Colorado, were referred to see a geriatrician uh, just as a consult visit. The arrows point out where those offices are. They are one floor apart within the same building. Um, and that visit would include a comprehensive geriatric assessment, as well as a separate visit with a pharmacist for a full medication review. Um, very high uh, or very positive response from patients. Um, many took that opportunity to then transfer their primary care into the geriatrics clinic because they were happy with how things went. Um, however, because we were asking people to go to a separate clinic space, there was sort of a mental block and a lot of people just did not want to do it. Um, they didn't want to be seen as uh, needing uh, aging specialty care. They didn't want to get to know a new care team. Uh, so there were a lot of patient side uh, barriers to referral. There were also a lot of provider side barriers. A lot of HIV specialists weren't really thinking about geriatrics in their usual assessment. They might not know about the program or they knew about it, but they forgot. So there weren't a ton of referrals uh, that were both placed and then completed despite this really close proximity um, and an attempt to put a geriatrician into the HIV clinic was also met with some billing barriers and we had problems with how we funded that model. Um, a perk of this, again, it was still very successful from the patient standpoint, um, but a big perk is that it didn't require much to set up. You just had to identify a geriatrician who wanted to see these patients and 
a referral process so that patients could get to that geriatrician and that was it didn't require new clinic space or new hiring or new training and um, so it is a good example of how a consultation model can be pretty easily started um, but there are quite a few barriers to making it happen next slide please um, when I came to Chicago, I tried to replicate this uh, in UChicago's Ryan White Clinic. Um, we had about 250 adults uh, living with HIV over the age of 50, which is about half of our total clinic population. The majority were Black and African American, um, and found quickly that there was a very high geriatric syndrome burden um, amongst our patients over 50, uh, even those just over 50. Uh, there had actually, before I ever came to the institution, had been historical efforts to incorporate geriatrics, but the primary barrier was simply geography. Um, our main campus in Hyde Park was about a 10 minute drive away from our geriatrics clinic in the South Shore neighborhood. Um, not far at all, but the idea, for patients, the idea of going to a place 10 minutes away, it was like I was sending them to an entirely different state. And so none of those efforts really took off and it really highlighted uh, the importance of co-location of services if possible. Slide. Um, what we did for HIV and aging at the University of Chicago is uh, within the Ryan White Clinic, we just designated an HIV and aging clinic. For me, it was on Fridays. Uh, it was the dually trained provider mod model in which um, I saw people for geriatrics consultation or uh, transfer entirely of their HIV care, in which I managed both HIV and primary care. Um, the clinic already had an on site ID pharmacist, an on site social worker, nursing. Uh, some of these team members are pictured here, but there are many more who I couldn't find pictures of. Um, and we opened it up to any patient over 50. If they wanted to see a geriatrician, if the HIV specialist felt they needed more uh, help with primary care needs or with geriatric specific needs, or if someone just was over 50 and wanted a new provider or was new to the clinic, uh, they were able to see me. Uh, the median age of patients that we saw was about 69. Um, so younger than what you're going to see in most geriatrics clinics. Um, I found that these patients had a very high geriatric syndrome burden. Uh, if you go back through those four M's, the ones that came up most often in my review of the panel were polypharmacy, cognitive impairment, uh, functional impairment, and osteoporosis. I would say uh, polypharmacy is the one I worried the most about. Cognitive impairment was the one that I got referrals for the most. Functional decline is what the patients worried the most about. And then osteoporosis was probably the thing that was missed the most often. So those, those were really the topics that I saw the most of. Next slide. The way that this clinic ran is it was a templated geriatric assessment, so more of a comprehensive geriatric assessment on the initial visit. Uh, we performed functional screening, cognitive screening, medication review, and a frailty assessment, um, which is a little bit more involved of a mobility assessment. Uh, we embedded the clinic into usual clinic workflow. Um, I had 60 minute initial visits and 30 minute returns. Geriatrics or especially comprehensive assessments do take a long time, which is uh, one barrier to their incorporation. Um, these were MD only unless I needed additional services. Most commonly, that was going to be our social worker or a pharmacist. Um, and it was able to be set up with uh, no special rooming, no special equipment. I did have a dynamometer, which I love very dearly and used to assess grip strength, but that was really the only extra tool I had, and we could have done just fine without it. Um, and thankfully for funding, this was able to be done as an extension of the geriatrics clinic. So I, as a geriatrician working in the HIV clinic, was able to just continue my work as though I were still seeing patients in our geriatrics clinic. So there were no funding barriers, which can be a big problem for initial setup. Next slide, please. So using this duly trained provider model, um, which again is sort of a co-management model as well, uh, these are some of the successes and barriers that we had. Um, there was a very high patient interest. Patients really liked uh, the HIV and aging clinic, often because many of them had never really had a primary care provider before. They'd just been seeing their HIV specialist for years and years and years. Um, a lot of new dementia diagnosis and management, um, which was especially a uh, relief for many of the providers referring patients to HIV and aging clinic. Um, we had excellent pharmacy support. Again, this sort of already existed. We have great HIV pharmacists, and we just got to keep taking advantage of uh, their amazing skills. Um, we had excellent insurance and drug coverage support. Again, something that Ryan White clinics are often really prepared for is getting figuring out how to get patients their drugs as cheaply as possible. Um, 
our social workers did an amazing job of this. And then we had excellent success with nursing home care coordination. Uh, because I was familiar with geri with other geriatricians, with some of the nursing homes in town, I even worked at one of them. And because one of our nurses had worked in nursing home systems before, we had a lot of great successes in making sure that our patients living in institutions uh, had well-coordinated care. Um, but some of the unexpected barriers that popped up uh, in this clinic model were things that I think I had been taking for granted in primary care, um, which is that we didn't have a system for getting patients DME. Um, we didn't have a system for getting people home health care, like home physical therapy or occupational therapy. Um, we didn't have a lot of great systems for referring people to dementia services. Um, I could do a lot of dementia screening and assessment on my own, but if I needed someone to go get a driving evaluation or neuropsych testing, um, we just didn't have any kind of pathway for that to happen. Um, and then similarly, getting patients uh, to primary care or geriatrics, especially as I left Chicago, <laughs> what really matters to patients is the strong relationship that they have with their HIV specialty team. Um, the idea that I would send someone to see a geriatrician or a primary care doctor in another location was just appalling to a lot of people. They're like, this is my home. This is where I want to stay. I don't care how complex my health gets. I want my HIV team to be the ones calling the shots, um, which was extremely humbling, occasionally frustrating, and really highlighted the importance of uh, creating all these geriatrics pathways within the clinic as best we could. Next slide, please. I'm going to end with just one more highlight about, again, a model that I think is worth exploring, but that is uh, somewhat in its infancy, which is the idea of a geriatric champion. Uh, this is something that's a bit more well known in the UK, um, and that is a team member that has interest or experience in the care of older adults who can be sort of a leader in both education, quality improvement efforts, and linkage to resources. Um, pictured here is Dr. Shelley, Shelley Williams at the University of Chicago, who has uh, led geriatric championship programs at faith-based organizations, so training for uh, church members in the community to become sort of the geriatric expert within their church or other house of worship. Um, they don't need to be master clinicians. They don't need to be like an amateur social worker. They just need to be someone who understands what dementia is like, um, who understands what dementia resources are out there and can help point people in the right direction. Uh, this type of individual that's training a champion in HIV and aging may be a model that's more feasible um, for clinics, especially those that don't have access to uh, geriatric specialty care. And again, it could be any team member or lay person. And it's something worth considering, especially if you or someone you know in the Ryan White Clinic uh, has already pre-identified themselves as a champion of HIV and aging. Next slide. All right, so in conclusion, we have dozens of high impact uh, geriatric screening and assessment tools that are out there, that are available to use, and we can easily incorporate into routine care without performing full comprehensive geriatric assessments. Um, in deciding which tools to handpick for your clinic, which uh, pathways or workflows to set up, the four M's are a very useful framework to kind of guide your thinking and figure out the areas that you're missing or that uh, need more improvement at the clinic level. Um, if you want to fully integrate geriatric care into uh, your Ryan White program, it can be achieved through a variety of clinic models. Um, these might require innovation, these might require some creativity, and to consider things like geography, existing resources and funding sustainability when you're brainstorming how best to uh, incorporate geriatric care in the long term. I think that's it. Uh, my contact information is here. Feel free to email or reach out via Twitter, and I will hand it back over to the rest of the team. Thank you, Dr. Walk. So a, a huge uh, uh, gratitude and appreciation for your presentation um, and offering such valuable information. It's extremely helpful as we um, kick off the Aging with HIV initiative. Um, and we, we obviously see why you are recognized as one of the experts in the field. Um, so thank you very much. Um, if you have any questions, please put them in the comment box and a moderator will um, read them or if you would like to uh, speak directly. Um, thank you very much again. Uh, next slide. So just a reminder as we wait for the questions, um, a reminder to go to the um, continuing education credit website to uh, claim your CE credits. Next slide. 
We want to also thank the audience for your attendance as well. And if you have any follow up questions, please feel free to reach out to me at tgant at hrsa.gov. We invite you to attend the final session of the HIV Aging Institute 301, which is accessing community resources for people aging with HIV. And it's scheduled for later today at 3.30 through 5 p.m. Um, I also want to remind you to pull down those um, tools that Dr. Walker has included in the chat box. I think they will be very helpful as you move forward in your own programs. Next slide. As you have heard, we have a new website. Visit the Ryan White HIV AIDS program at www.ryanwhite.hrsa.gov. Next slide. And finally, we encourage you to follow us on social media. Just another reminder to put your questions in the chat box and we will move from there. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. Before we begin our uh, Q&A session, we would like to, of course, again, thank our presenters for addressing a timely and interesting topic. At this time, we will pose the questions that Tracy had alluded to from our attendees that we've been collecting throughout the presentation. Please note that we can still submit questions to the chat feature. So as you can see, our presenters are online and I will start with one of the first questions that we have. So one of the first questions is under which HRSA service category can we cover gym memberships for people with living people living with diagnosed HIV 50 plus. Um, Dr. Walker, you want to talk about that in relation to how you all have done it in your clinic, and then I'll talk about it from HRSA perspective. I don't have a great answer. I saw that question and emailed my coordinator because um, in geriatrics clinics, I'm very accustomed to having the majority of patients being on Medicare. We typically will defer to either silver sneakers or other local community programs that are low cost or free. Uh, for those patients in that gap uh, who are not on Medicare yet, um, I don't know what HRSA services would cover gym memberships. I would say that a question like this would be uh, excellent to pose to your project officer to discuss any, um, any options, if it's an, an allowable cost, um, and since it's not necessarily a direct service, um, it's worth having that discussion with your project officer. That's a great question. Thank you. Question number two, what are HRSA HAB and CMS doing to educate consumers directly about polypharmacy risk and their options to obtain an annual comprehensive medication review that would be covered by Medicare? I think, again, that's probably a, a HRSA question. Um, I think that as we are beginning the Aging with HIV initiative, um, we'll, we'll be better informed about how to uh, disseminate this information to the community. So as I mentioned in the beginning, please stay tuned to the aging landing page on Target HIV as the dissemination um, demonstration sites begin to get up and going, um, there'll be a, additional information that comes forth with that. And I think we'll be able to answer that question within that those um, uh, examples that are presented. Thank Another you. Another great question. Mm -hmm. Why is the beers list not integrated into the drug interaction checkers used by prescribers and clinical pharmacists? Uh, I really wish it was. It is integrated into some of them. Um, one of the most commonly used is LexiComp, which does include a section on geriatric dosing recommendations. I would say probably about half of the drug databases and interaction checkers out there will include the beers list or other geriatric warnings, uh, but not all do. Uh, that may be because the beers, part, part of the reason maybe that the beers list is updated about every five years and systems don't always want to continually update. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Walker. Question number four, what, at what stage of cognitive impairment do you start recommending long-acting injectables? ART, sorry. 
Um, there's no set stage. I will base that more off of someone's functional capability. If someone has been taking their one to two pill a day antiretroviral regimen for years and they continue to have no problems with it and I don't have a great reason to change it, um, we may just keep going. Um, but even in people without cognitive impairment who are having trouble uh, with adherence, long acting antiretrovirals become a much more uh, appealing option. Um, I definitely have used long acting antiretrovirals for patients with more advanced dementia who have uh, trouble managing or taking uh, any pill, um, in which case I may be using it more for um, palliative options to uh, reduce any symptoms of active HIV infection as best we can. So it is, it's a wonderful tool that is probably being underused, but I think there's a lot of well uh, justified excitement around it, especially in older adults. Thank you. Next question, what type of, or what model of psychosocial services can help geriatric people living with diagnosed HIV? Um, I'm less sure what you mean by that question. Would love a uh, clarification. I will say that um, from my passing familiarity with um, the counseling services that are out there, uh, most types of therapies are equally valid in older adults. There's no uh, preferred method of counseling or of therapy. Um, I think maybe that's what you're asking. If, if you ask the question, could you type into the chat if it was answered or if there's further insight you would like um, based on what you asked? So I'll give a, that individual a second to do that. In the meantime, um, how frequently should functional screening be done in a year? Uh, that's a great question. I, I try to make sure it's something that doesn't fall off of my radar and will make an effort to do a formal functional screen uh, at least once a year. Other good opportunities to do it are to uh, ask people about functional status after any major illness or hospitalization or surgery when that's likely to change. Uh, I think more frequent than that, you might be uh, overdoing it. But I think an annually is probably a good uh, a good time, and that's why it's included in Medicare's annual wellness visit template. Thank you. What are the options for a Ryan White Clinic not in an academic medical center to fund a geriatric clinic? Yeah, that's tough. I, as I think I mentioned probably five times in the talk and is the bane of my existence is there just aren't a lot of geriatricians, especially outside of medical, uh, academic medical centers and those that are are often working in nursing home care. Um, that's where we need to rely on the staff that we have um, and try to build their geriatric skills in any way we can, if that's with one-off trainings or certificate programs um, or uh, exposure to geriatrics, if they have an opportunity to spend time at a nearby academic medical center, or other geriatric practice. Um, again, any non-formally trained or person that's not formally trained in geriatrics can still use a lot of those tools, perform a lot of those assessments. And that's probably what we're going to have to leverage, not just in Ryan White clinics, but in most uh, primary care clinics across the country to meet the needs of our rapidly aging older adults without a lot of geriatricians. Thank you. How do you approach the sexual health assessment in your model? Um, I didn't really include it in my talk because I think it's just as important in young people as it is in older adults. So it's not a whole lot different. Make sure you're asking all of your older adults about their sexual health because it is just as important as function and mentation and medications are. I wish it started with an M so we could include that as well. Thank you. This is in reference to the previous question um, that we were trying to get clarity on. They said they are trying to assess what non-medical case management or supportive services are needed. Are there recommendations for group interventions or programs or individual level case management service as a better use of HRSA Part A funds? Mm. I think, 
I don't want to answer your question with just some rambling, but I'm going to ramble a little bit. Um, I think there's a lot of value in both uh, like group interventions and larger supportive service programs, as well as individual case management, especially for those um, with dementia at greater need. They may need that one on one. Um, funding it is a question better left for HRSA, but one reason that uh, you may not see a lot of case management funding specific to older adults is that every geographic area is going to have an area agency on aging that receives funding for those services that should already exist but are often underutilized. Those services may also be underfunded, but please check them out. Um, I'm sure that's something they're going to be talking more about in the uh, 301 talk later this afternoon. Thank you. All right. Moving on to the next one. Do you have any suggestions for improving levels of social integration as people age, which is linked to less depression and better longevity? Um, I take what I can get. If I learn of any programming out there for, uh, especially for older adults living with HIV, older adults in general, uh, LGBTQ older adults, um, I, make a copy of it, stick it in my folder, give it to every patient I come across because it's one of the harder things to build is social networks. Um, I think for clinicians, one of the most effective things you can do is just try to identify patients who are uh, experiencing loneliness or isolation as early as possible. One way to get at that quickly is by doing uh, advanced care planning, like naming an MDPOA is something that we should be doing anyway, that can also give you a hint at some of those higher risk patients. There are questionnaires out there for screening for isolation and loneliness that you could include alongside uh, depression screens. But that building that uh, social network is tough and is going to require leaning upon uh, local aid service organizations, uh, local community organizations. Um, often, the, again, the Area Agency on Aging may have some tips or at least a linkage to senior centers that will have local programming. I will say things are improving uh, since COVID with more and more people pivoting to uh, virtual options, but they're out there and it's tough. And I think that question came from uh, Dr. Escaljado, whose talk you should also check out from yesterday if you haven't seen that yet. Thank you. This is a quick question about bone density for the over 50 year olds. Will it be affected and on what degree? Hmm. Um, we worry about bone density in um, well, most adults, really, but especially uh, postmenopausal women. Uh, the risk appears to be higher for those living with HIV, even if well controlled, uh, due to a confluence of factors. That risk may be up to twice as high. Um, but this serves as you know, a good reminder that we need to be screening men and women at a younger age than you might in a typical primary care clinic, just to make sure we're not missing something that we can pretty relatively easily intervene upon. Okay, thank you. Any suggestions in terms of ART in patients with osteoporosis? Avoid TAF containing regimen. Any, oh, these are multiple questions, by the way. Any long-term data on HIV patients on biophosphonates for osteoporosis, for example, data on morbidity or mortality? Um, when I'm talking about antiretroviral therapy uh, in patients with osteoporosis, I'm mostly trying to avoid TDF-containing regimens, uh, which I find a lot of uh, HIV specialists are already well familiar with because that may increase the risk of bone density loss. Um, Interesting there, interestingly, there's not a lot of data on any osteoporosis therapies in older adults with HIV in terms of long-term morbidity or mortality. Um, it is assumed that, that we know that bisphosphonates are safe and well-tolerated. We just don't have quite as much long-term data on fracture risk and death. Um, it is assumed that any osteoporosis therapy out there should work just as well. Um, there doesn't seem to be anything different about the type of bone loss that's happening to older adults with HIV. Um, it's just that it happens to a greater degree. So those same therapies we would use in any older adult um, should still hold, and bisphosphonates are sort of our first line. Okay. And then are there any successful examples of states or regional health systems designating an HIV geriatric center of excellence 
and using telehealth or telemedicine to provide access through Ryan White clinics throughout the state. I don't know about that. Tracy, do you know of any examples? I not off the top of that is a great question. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, not off the top of my head. No, it sounds like a really good to do list item. Exactly. <laughs> Be happy we to will definitely that. keep that question um, and, and look in depth into that. Yes, that's, that's a really great question. Very insightful. Great reminder to visit Target HIV for uh, when the information begins to be posted. Yes, um, if you if you want to get close to that dream, there um, there are a lot of regional HIV centers of excellence or HIV education centers, and there are a lot of geriatric uh, like centers of excellence or training centers. Um, especially if you look for programs that have a geriatrics workforce enhancement program grant, which is also HRSA or a GWEP. Um, you'll probably, you might be able to find one, either an HIV or a geriatric center of excellence in your local area um, or region. Uh, I don't, just don't know a lot of combined services or programs. Thank you. Next question and comment. I'm blessed to be an adult gero, gero primary care nurse practitioner and HIV specialist, but it's still so much to leverage. Many of my patients fit the P, PC and AG bill, but as the only full-time provider getting access to special, sorry, but as the only full-time provider getting access to specialty care is tough. What ancillary services can be used in an FQHC, behavioral health consultants, counselor, community case management situation? Um. I think within an FQHC, because you are going to have a generally a good support network uh, versus a sort of freestanding primary care clinic, um, you may be able to take advantage of someone in behavioral health, social work, or counseling, or case management, any of those categories you listed, um, that might be willing to serve as your geriatrics expert or geriatrics champion, uh, someone who can become really familiar with the area agency on aging, familiar with contacts at uh, adult protective services, services for the blind, uh, other local agencies already serving older adults. I think that's gonna be the best way to leverage your ancillary services, kind of identify that champion. Um, because even they may not feel totally comfortable with geriatrics, but if they know what's out there, they can point uh, clients and patients in the right direction. Um, the other thing I would look to just because it comes up most often in my practice is if the FQHC does not have great access to dementia services or um, experts in, in dementia care that because that's this particularly high need group, it may be again very helpful to identify any local memory clinic, whether that's in neurology, geriatrics, psychiatry, that you can refer your patients to. There may also be um, dementia-specific community organizations that can help out. I think that's a kind of high yield service to identify. Okay, thank you. So do you have any recommendations for remedial exercise and activities to help reintroduce load-bearing exercise and activities into their normal daily life? given that such exercises help one's own body to repair one's bones? Uh, my general style in the clinic is I tell people, I want you to do whatever you're going to do. Like whatever exercise I can get out of you is going to help. Um, to give some direction to that, uh, there is a lot of research suggesting that resistance-based exercises are going to be more high yield in older adults for uh, building muscle mass, uh, and preserving function. This is going to be things like uh, lifting weights, uh, using elastic bands, anything that really makes you put pressure on your muscles rather than strict cardio. Um, but for those who feel like, wow, I'm not a weightlifter, uh, it may be more high yield, especially if they're having balance issues to identify, say, a Tai Chi program or um, a chair yoga program, other more balance-based exercise uh, might be helpful for remediation. And this is, again, 
figure out who your best friend is in the physical therapy world, whether that's the office down the street or someone within your organization. If you can have a physical therapy champion that you can rely on for questions like this, uh, they are superstars in medicine. All right. And one of the last questions we have so far, we have about five minutes left. Can you have, or is osteoporosis and osteopenia the same thing? Uh, osteopenia is loss of bone mass to a lesser degree of osteoporosis. Uh, it does predict a higher risk of fracture, but not quite as severe as those with even thinner bones. So uh, osteopenia still may warrant some intervention and is a good reminder to do some weight bearing exercise and get some calcium. And when it crosses into osteoporosis, we're more likely to need specific therapies. So it's all a spectrum. Okay, thank you. I see there's another, um, oh, no other questions at this point. Um, I did want to add to a comment from, an answer to a question about sexual health and the asker had said, uh, except older persons living with HIV have more sexual disorders. Um, really great point. Um, by neglecting sexual health screening, you might also miss a lot of functional disorders that affect both sexual health and often um, urinary and bowel symptoms. Um, I will include those in my general functional assessment is are you having any incontinence, any trouble uh, urinating, any trouble having bowel movements, uh, very high rates of all of the above in older adults. And it's uh, often something that can be intervened upon, even though patients may have this misperception that like, well, I, I have incontinence and I always will. Um, that's not necessarily the case. So yeah, important plug that sexual health screening is going to catch a lot more than just, do we need to screen for STIs? All right. And then one other question that just jumped in here was, is anyone teaching how to fall safely? Oh, great question. A physical therapist can do that. They can, for people at especially high risk, they can teach you how to fall safely. Like if you are slow falling and can react, they'll teach you some ways to prevent fractures. They can also help teach people how to get up off the floor if they experience a fall. So if someone is at especially high risk or has fallen many times, it's one more great reason that they need some physical therapy in their life. You may want to, when referring people, ask the therapist specifically to address that to make sure it happens. Right. So we have about three minutes left and I don't, oh, here's one more. Why don't we have more of these clinics now in Ryan White clinics? Oh, I wish we did. Um, again, it's, it's partly there aren't a lot of geriatric specialists out there. So it is hard to integrate with something you don't have. Um, and that is happening at the same time that we have workforce shortages in HIV. And it is happening at the same time of this like total shift in HIV care. Like more has changed in the world of HIV in my, not even my career, my lifetime uh, than in most fields of medicine and medicine changes slowly. So while efforts like this and the website that's gonna be up and uh, the grants that are out there all are really great at trying to solve this problem, um, it's slow and full integration of geriatric care into HIV and primary care in general um, is a constant struggle. Okay. We're working on it. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you both. I, I'm not seeing any other questions in the chat. I'll give another 10 seconds if anyone thought of anything. Natalie, there is one question from, I think it's Julius Levine. Mm -hmm. uh, Julius, if you want to come off of mute and ask your question. I think the question was, um, why isn't HRSA funding more of these type of clinics? That is a great question. Um, and that is the initiative uh, in plans now. Uh, one, to understand how to incorporate um, geriatric services into current uh, programs, of which a lot of programs are actually doing. Um, it's just not necessarily highlighted as of yet, um, but we're bringing it to the forefront so others can learn from uh, programs that are doing it. Um, so please, uh, again, I hate to keep plugging it, <laughs> but please go to the Target HIV landing page um, for the aging 
with HIV Initiative, which the demonstration sites will post uh, various resources and uh, links to um, documentation and best practices um, for overall programs to incorporate into their programs. And I will say that our uh, Dr. Walker is one of those demonstration sites um, to post many of the lessons learned uh, for other programs to be able to um, uh, incorporate these into their programs. I see Julius has his hand raised, his or her hand raised. Can Hello, you, can you hear me? There you go. Yes. There you go. Uh, yep, we uh, hear you. Hi, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Orker, that was a great talk. I do a lot of policy work around aging and HIV and work with the aging geriatric clinics uh, all over the country, including Compass. And in New York, we have uh, uh, at Mount Sinai uh, Geriatric Clinic funded by the recent HRSA grant for the $10 million for 10 clinics in over three years. But my concern is, is that this is such a very serious problem, as you all know, and as you highlighted in your talk, and just 10 clinics for only three years is just inadequate. We really need this kind of care in every Ryan White clinic all over the country where they have a high number of people over 65 or over 60 who are aging. And it's just inadequate to only have 10 clinics funding funded. We really can't wait uh, till the end of that grant and then they, re they evaluate and then they decide what to do. That's just inadequate. The CDC now reports 40% of people, rather 200,000 people right now are over 60. And by 2030, 400,000 will be over 60. So we really need these clinics now. We can't wait. People are getting strokes. People are dying. You, you very well uh, characterized the problem we have with aging. So I ask the folks here from HRSA and you, Dr. Walker, why we don't have these clinics now. Uh, the, clearly the models are there, your model is there, and we need to do this more than we're doing now. So please tell us why we can't do this now. There are clinicians that can do this. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. We, we appreciate that comment. Um, we will take that, that information to heart and bring that back to HRSA leadership for discussion. Uh, Dr. Walker, you wanna, in closing, um, respond in any way? Yeah, I think, I'd, again, this is even outside of my HIV role, this is my constant struggle <laughs> uh, because even now, um, most medical schools require no geriatrics training um, and family medicine and internal medicine uh, residencies require uh, two weeks, I believe. Um, and so there's a huge pipeline problem in the field of geriatrics. There's a huge pipeline problem of uh, clinicians knowing uh, even basic geriatric uh, tools and assessments out of medical school if they're doing another specialty. Um, and that just like feeds into the problem even more. Um, so there are clinicians like me and uh, great pharmacists, great social workers who have geriatric knowledge uh, run programs like this, um, but there, there really aren't many of us. Um, I think I probably know personally all of the dually trained providers out there, and I, that's really one of our biggest problems. Um, so anything, anyone on this call who has um, also advocacy roles in the world of aging or in the world of medical education, that is a huge area of need um, on top of um, advocacy through HRSA and other HIV organizations. So keep it up. Thank you. Unfortunately, we've run out of time, but um, um, please join the, the uh, last Aging Institute session this afternoon, um, session 301. Thank you. Thank you. And one last thing, thank you for participating. And as part of us continuing to provide these timely topics and interesting speakers, we appreciate you filling out the session evaluation which is located when you clicked the, the uh, session ses uh, the session tab right next to where you download my calendar. If you refresh it to the left of that is the evaluation. If you could fill that out and give us continued feedback, that would be great. And please keep in mind anything else that you would like to address for your um, continuing education credits as well. Thank you so much and have a great day and enjoy the rest of your conference.